Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Dan Ashley, news anchor of ABC7 News Television in San Francisco and also board member of the Commonwealth Club. I will be moderating this afternoon's program. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, the former airline pilot who landed the plane on the Hudson, the miracle on the Hudson, and author of the new book, Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage from America's Leaders. You know, on January 14th, 2009, Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger was one of many commercial airline pilots in the United States, respected in the industry certainly, but unknown to the rest of us. By then, Captain Sullenberger had logged nearly 20,000 hours in the skies in a distinguished but uneventful three decades at U.S. Airways, 40 years as a pilot. Then came January 15, 2009. We know the story. Flight 1549 takes off from New York. Moments later, a flock of birds decide to share the same airspace as that plane with catastrophic results. Both engines shut down when birds were sucked inside. The next three minutes saved 155 lives and transformed Captain Sullenberger's life. He became an instant American hero. Fast forward to May 30th, 2012. Today, Captain Sullenberger is a successful consultant, advocate for the airline industry, for medical safety, best-selling author of his first book, Highest Duty, My Search for What Really Matters, and now author of the new book, Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage from America's Leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dan. And you've already done much of the hard work for me. You see, you you managed to get them to actually turn off their portable electronic devices. <laughs> That's tough to do these days. It is. In fact, I was at another event recently, and the the commentator uh, remarked on my uh, you know, baritone and uh, sound like a commanding voice, and I said, well, would it re make you turn off your cell phone? So I'm glad it did. If you're in the back of the plane. In the back of the plane. Uh, great to see you again, as always. Uh, let me start with uh, the past three years, which have been a whirlwind, I know, and transformative for you. Describe what the past three years of your life have been like, suddenly thrust into public life. As soon as we struck that uh, flock of Canada geese, and they were, that's the species, Canada geese. They weren't Canadian geese. They were Canada geese. Um, our lives changed instantly, completely forever. Everyone on the airplane and their families changed instantly, forever. Um, and at first, it was overwhelming. It was as if we had the world's biggest fire hose pointed at me and my family for at least a year and a half. It was traumatic, but ultimately the source of wonderful opportunities like this one. You have now spent uh, the last several years, and you were doing this work uh, as a consultant prior to the events of January 15, 2009, but that has certainly accelerated. You're an aviation consultant on CBS News. You advocate for airline safety and greater respect for pilots uh, and professionals in the industry and also medical safety. Take us through some of the consulting work that you're doing. Well, one of the things I've been able to do is to leverage my life experience. And uh, instead of uh, doing something completely different in an unrelated field, I've been able to take what I've learned over 45 years now of flying, uh, 30 years as an airline pilot, and my six years as a fighter pilot, and all that time being a continuous lifelong learner with great intellectual curiosity uh, and apply what I've learned and what we've learned in aviation to other domains, including patient safety and medicine, including industry. Uh, you know, we've done things in aviation that very few other industries have done. Uh, we've taken something that's inherently risky, inherently involves risk, and made it ultra safe. Uh, and one of the ways we've done that is by reminding ourselves on a daily basis on every flight that in spite of how routine and commonplace uh, air travel has become, in spite of how easy we make it seem, it's not at all easy. It's hard. Because when I take you up in an airliner, what we're actually doing is pushing a tube filled with people through the upper atmosphere seven or eight miles above the earth 
uh, at 80 percent of the speed of sound in a hostile environment with the outside temperatures to minus 70 and we must return it safely to the surface every time and we do over millions of flights and your chance of dying in a large jet airliner crash in the U.S. in the decade from 1967 to 1976 were about one in two million. Now they're closer to one in 20 million. And so we've addressed the, the technological issues and we've addressed the human performance part of the safety equation. And it's that human performance part of the safety equation that we're now beginning to apply in earnest to many other fields. When you describe it as flying in a tube seven, eight miles above the earth, I don't want to fly as much. <laughs> well, it, it, it's safe or not. It, it feels, you know, what, what's remarkable about, about it is that when you're doing it, it feels like you're sitting in your living room. Of course, the, the chair may not be as wide, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the experience that you, that you have uh, because of the dedication, the training and experience of a lot of individual people at every part of the process makes it something that's, that's very uh, safe and very, very um, commonplace now. Uh, Sully, most pilots that I know, if not all pilots I know, have a passion for flight. And in many respects, you're one of the lucky people. You knew at a very early age what you wanted to do. Literally five. I, I went through a brief period of about four and a half, I think, where I wanted to be a policeman or, or a fireman. Now we, now we call them firefighters. But by the time I was five, the, the die was cast. I knew I was going to spend my life flying airplanes, and then I was actually fortunate enough actually to be able to do it for my entire professional career. And I think that was a huge advantage because when you do something that you love, when you do something that you really care about, you're, you're willing to work harder at it, to become more expert at it. Uh, and you do, can derive you know, purpose and meaning and satisfaction from it. And that's something I'm trying to do my whole life. Uh, do you miss flying commercial planes? Now you fly all over the world, but you're not in the pilot seat anymore. Well, I'm, I'm used to being a passenger. In fact, even before my retirement from the airlines, I was often a passenger commuting from the West Coast to my, my flight assignments back east. Um, but in those days, it was often uh, the middle seat and coach in the last row. And now, fortunately, I often have a chance to have a nicer seat than that. But, uh, but I, I, it's still a lifelong passion for me to fly airplanes, and I do fly smaller airplanes now on family trips and short-range business trips. But I, I don't really miss the job itself. And, and what's happened to it and the way it's changed. In fact, for those of my generation who started flying as an airline pilot 30 or 35 years ago, it's almost difficult to remember what it was like when we started when the job was almost entirely only about flying. Hmm. And now, like in so many fields, uh, it's about also many other peripheral issues, whether it's security or passenger issues or some other requirement. Um, it's, uh, it's changed a lot, in, in addition to you know, the working conditions. And the nature of flying has changed some, has it not, in terms of the technology on board an airplane? It, it's, there's much more automation and much more computerization. Yes, and that's also been a huge sea change in what the piloting career is about. Because now what we have is, in the cockpits of our airliners, we have a human and technology system. And they must work seamlessly together. Uh, now we have a lot of technological assistance, but we must now use it wisely and understand it completely. So one of the challenges, quite frankly, now with these highly automated airplanes, these high technology airplanes, is that in addition to the things that we've always had to know about an in-depth knowledge of the airplane in itself and all its component systems, electrical, hydraulic, fuel, pressurization, and others, we now must know the automation technologies inside and out, know exactly what it's going to do, when, how it's going to work, when it will automatically change from one phase to another, uh, and be the absolute master of that as well. At the same time, we have enough practice um, man manually manipulating the controls and uh, design our systems in such a way that we remain engaged and aware of the processes going on, that we're able to quickly and effectively intervene if, uh, if the technology isn't doing what it's supposed to do. So it's, it's a whole other system, a series of challenges that we must, uh, that we must face. Uh, I, I wanted to, I'll take you back just briefly to that day, only to ask this question, because we, we, we know the story so well. But you spoke about how safe flying has become, and particularly in the last decade or couple of decades. In all of your years flying, you'd never had an incident that came close to this and didn't expect to, did you? No. As a matter of fact, uh, our technology is so uh, reliable now that it's possible for an airline pilot to go through an entire working career and never experience in flight the failure of even a single engine. 
And that was the case for me on January 14, 2009. <laughs> I'd been flying at that point for 42 years. I had 20,000 hours of flying time, and I had never had a failure of a, of a single engine in flight. And at that point in my career, I was 57, almost 58. I, I thought it likely that I would not, hmm. and I was wrong. But part of the challenge for us is to always be cognizant of the fact that the chance of us happening, of that happening to us tomorrow, is the same as it was today or yesterday, and to always be aware uh, and engaged, to be vigilant and avoid complacency. Because throughout my entire career, 42 years, I never knew on any given day when or if I might face some ultimate challenge. Or as I might tell you now, I never knew out of my entire career which three and a half minutes I'd be judged on. Well, you were judged very well. You performed brilliantly that day. So if there is such a thing as a permanent record that we were all threatened with early on in our, in our school careers, <laughs> it's probably the NTSB investigation of that flight. Um, talk about complacency a little bit, because as flying has become so routine and, and uh, with so few incidents, is it a challenge as you consult in the airline industry to make certain that not only pilots and flight crews, but also airline executives, mechanics, everyone associated with keeping a plane safely in the air, remember that it can happen even though it's very unlikely? Is that a challenge? Absolutely it is. We're in, in that sense, we're a victim of our own success. You know, one of the differences between uh, my domain and, and some others, uh, for example, if you could imagine the operation of a U.S. Navy uh, aircraft carrier, especially on the flight deck, where you have arresting cables trapping uh, landing airplanes, where you have catapults launching in about three seconds, a 100,000-pound uh, jet going from zero to 140 or 50 knots in the length of a, uh, you know, a football field. Um, it's an inherent risky environment, but the risks are obvious. The risks are immediate. We face some of the same risks, not the same degree, but they don't seem as apparent or as immediate. And so it's easy to, to forget that they're still there. It's easy to forget lessons that we have learned before. And in, in, uh, in almost everything that we know about aviation, every rule we have, every procedure we follow, much of the equipment we have, we have because someone somewhere a long time ago died. And we were determined never to have that happen again. And so we learned from it. And so we, we can't afford to have to relearn important lessons that have been bought at great cost, sometimes literally with blood. And so it, we do have to keep reminding ourselves. We can no longer define safety solely as the absence of recent accidents. If we do that, we're not doing enough. We need to proactively look for risks and mitigate them before they can lead to a bad outcome. And that requires great leadership, and that requires vigilance, and that requires a, a having a safety culture in which uh, we engage our employees as, as partners. Uh, Sully, someone in our audience today asks this question. I'm concerned about the air traffic controller system. What should be done to improve the system uh, in terms of working conditions and safety? What are your uh, thoughts on that? You know, our air traffic controller on Flight 1549, a young man named Patrick Harden, uh, works at New York Departure on Long Island. And he's a second generation controller. His father also worked in that same facility. Great young man, very dedicated. And to show you how dedicated he was to his job, um, he was convinced during our flight when we were unable to make it to a runway, and he was desperately trying to get us to a runway, any runway, he was convinced at the end of the flight that everyone on our airplane had perished and that he had failed mm -hmm. uh, because he couldn't get us back to a runway. And he was distraught. But in spite of how distraught he felt, um, he fulfilled his last professional official duty before he would allow himself to be relieved by an oncoming controller. And he gave the oncoming controller a full changeover briefing about what had just happened and about uh, the departure conditions in, in use at, at LaGuardia. So we have very dedicated controllers who, like many of us, work in imperfect systems with imperfect managements, uh, and they do their best on, the, on every day. Uh, I hope that in many domains, including air traffic control, we have more effective leadership, we have improved safety cultures and improved work rules so that we can more consistently have high quality performance on, on every shift for every flight. Sully, you mentioned the improved safety record from 1967, that decade, up, onto the, uh, up to the present day. Do you anticipate, given the cost pressure 
the schedule pressure, the passenger load pressure, all of that. Do you anticipate safety to continue to improve? In other words, if we look 20, 30 years down the road, will it be one in 30 million, one in 40 million chances of dying in an airline accident? That's up to us, quite frankly. It's up to all of us uh, to choose leaders who have the ability, occasionally at least, to take a longer view, to make difficult decisions that will pay off 30 years from now, or as uh, former Michigan Governor uh, Jennifer Granholm, uh, one of the subjects of the interviews in my book, said, one of the duties of, of a leader is to plant trees under whose shade you will never sit. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do uh, in this culture of instant gratification and sound bites. Uh, so it's my hope that we will do that, but it's by no means a given. So we need to make investments in people and technology and our systems. We need to have leaders who can take the longer view and plan now for making safe, uh, safer skies 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. And if we, if we simply do nothing, that's also a choice, and that will be a choice that guarantees that we will not get to that goal. Let me uh, bird walk, pun intended, for just a moment because someone raises an interesting issue that I have heard asked a dozen times, and I'm sure you've heard it a million times. Uh, since your incident uh, three years ago, there have been a number of bird incidents involving airplanes. Why can't something be done to keep birds from being sucked into a plane? The, the question I'm always asked, why can't they put a screen in front of a jet engine? Well, I've been asked that too, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, very early on, and my wonderful wife, Lori, is right here in the front row, uh, who will testify this, we received 50,000 communications, mail and email, in the first few months after this happened three and a half years ago. And some people sent us a letter, complete with drawings of just such a screen, <laughs> and they were, they were proposing that it be Patent on, the, pending. On, the, on the front of every in, uh, engine. We had a lot of people suggest that. So obviously it's not a completely original idea. But as you... As you understand, a jet engine has to take in air through the front to supply the, the thrust. And uh, we can't have anything on the front of the engine that's going to be a uh, significant disruption of that, uh, that free airflow. Also, we have to operate in icing conditions in clouds in the wintertime. And so it's important that, that nothing be on the front of the engine that might ice over and further impede the airflow into the engine. So it's, it's a complicated issue. Uh, unfortunately, bird populations have increased in the last uh, decades. Uh, our flights have increased, uh, and as airplanes have gotten more fuel efficient, the engines have actually become somewhat quieter, and it's difficult for birds to hear us coming. And if we, if they don't, if they aren't flying toward us, and if they don't see us coming, uh, it's difficult for them to avoid us. And at the, tr at the speeds that we're traveling, uh, and as, as was the case on our flight, we, there wasn't time from the time we saw them until we hit them to maneuver away from them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are working on this issue, but it's, it's not an easy one to solve. The one thing we do know, though, for a fact, the one thing we know that will work is not to put anything near airport runways that's likely to attract birds, whether it's a garbage dump, landfill, wetlands. Uh, that's the one thing that we do know it will, will keep these things from happening. All right. Thank you for debunking the screen theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sully, again, this is sort of an amalgam of a couple of questions from the audience. In your mind, what, are the, what is the biggest or the, or the biggest safety concerns for the airline industry today? What would you highlight as the most critical issue? Uh, the, mo the most fundamental issue, I think, is one of leadership, uh, the one of a full and accurate appreciation of the risks that we face, and a real understanding of how economics and safety are linked. Uh, I wish that we had more leaders who uh, would make their actions match their rhetoric. You know, everyone says that they want to make safety paramount. Everyone says that they want to do the best they can for our passengers. But in many ways, we're not doing that right now. We're not doing the best that we know how to do. We're not investing in, in the kinds of things we should be investing in, whether it's uh, more training for pilots or better rules to mitigate fatigue. Um, there are things that we need to do better, and right now we're not. Uh, Every choice that, that we make has safety implications. Uh, budget choices certainly do. Administrative choices certainly can. And we have organizations now that are run by people who are financial experts. We no longer have uh, leaders at our companies, our airline companies, who are operational experts. They haven't been taught the, safe, the science of safety. We need to help them understand the implications of their choices. We need to help them make important investments that will keep aviation getting safer. 
Um, and right now, in, in many areas, we're, we're simply not doing that. There are, there are intense cost pressures that have an effect on everything that we do. We have cheapened flying in every way, and my concern, quite frankly, is if we continue in this direction, we may make flying cheaper at any cost. Sobering thought, obviously. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, the people who were on that plane with you. You're still in touch with Jeff Skiles, your co-pilot, and a number of others on the plane. Right. Uh, tell us about that. Well, Jeff, of course, and a great colleague that day and since, he also has felt this intense obligation to use this notoriety for good. He also has worked tirelessly on Capitol Hill to try to improve aviation safety, along with another group that's done great work, and that's the, the families of the victims of the Buffalo crash in February 2009, uh, the Continental Connection, Colgan Air 3407 flight. A month after yours? A month after ours that tragically uh, took 50 lives, 49 on the airplane and one person whose house was struck by the crash on the ground. Um, the, these uh, families of the Buffalo victims have been tireless, ardent advocates on Capitol Hill uh, of the highest levels of safety. It's largely through their efforts that we've gotten through the Congress bills that require the FAA to, uh, to uh, post, uh, do, uh, to write new rules on mitigating fatigue and on increasing pilot experience. And we're waiting for this new final rule on pilot experience to be written. The comment period ended April 30th, so we'll see uh, what's to be done with that. Unfortunately, and as, as, as sadly as it's typical, the industry, the airlines and all their lobbying organizations have been fighting all these rules vociferously. Uh, lobbyists, money being spent, uh, millions, to try to fight any new uh, rule that they consider to be a regulatory burden or to increase their cost even by a small amount. And Sully can tell you something that I think you might find rather surprising, even shocking, about the flight that, that crashed that he mentioned. It is, describe the way those contractors get the job and then tell us what the pilot was being paid. To fly an airplane, mind you, with people on board. Most of the uh, connection or, um, or express carriers for the major U.S. airlines are not wholly owned subsidiaries of the major airline. Instead, they're, they're third-party contractors, and they compete on the basis of cost. And so when you get on a regional airplane, uh, you're often flying on the lowest bidder. And they, the, the, the major airlines have created this regional system to outsource the, the more experienced, the more well-compensated, the, the uh, the higher benefit jobs at the major carriers to less well-paid, less experienced, less uh, well-benefited uh, jobs at the regional carriers. Uh, it's not always the case. There are some that are doing a good job, but it's, it's on, on average not the same level of, um, of the robust safety systems we see at the major jet airlines where the pilots have more experience. They generally get better training um, and there are more safety systems in place. So it is of concern to me that, uh, that that's still the case, that we still have not achieved what we call one level of safety so that when you get on a regional airplane, you know it's at the same level as all the major jet airlines. We're just not quite there yet. And on flight 3407 in Buffalo 2009, the first officer was making about $16,400 a year uh, and could not live in Newark where she was based and had to commute from her family's home in Seattle and couldn't afford to buy a hotel room uh, in Newark. Uh, in fact, I did the math one day at, at, before an interview, and I figured out if she spent her entire gross salary every month, didn't pay any taxes, didn't have any expenses, she couldn't get through an entire month buying hotel rooms in Newark. If you took a cab here today, your cab driver probably makes more money. I would hope so. Yeah. So that's, so it's, we don't have a pilot shortage. What we have a, a shortage of is pilots who are experienced we're willing to, to live under those conditions for very long. You know, people who, even like I did who have a, a passion for flying will do that for a while, but if they don't see advancement, if they don't eventually get to a, a situation where they have better pay and, and conditions, they will tire of it. I mean, eventually we all want the same things. Eventually we want to have a family. Eventually we want to have a, try, a chance to try to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Eventually you want to have a life, and you won't stay for, forever in situations where you can't eventually get those things. Are most pilots, commercial pilots today, Sully, still coming out of the military? That's still the case? No. As, as a matter of fact, they're not. Um, That's changed. Uh, it's changed a lot. Uh, 30, 35 years ago when I started my airline career, uh, about 75 or 80 percent of the pilot force came from military flight training. Um, 
Now the, the ratio is just about reversed. And now uh, about that many are, are civilian only trained and, and about 25 or 30 percent are, uh, are military trained aviators. And not that the military training always is better, but with someone who's been through the, the disciplined, rigorous, uh, highly structured and supervised military flight regime, you have greater confidence that there are no major gaps in knowledge. You know for sure that they've flown high-performance jet airplanes and not just small single-engine propeller planes in their training. You know that they've been significantly challenged. You know that there's been a lot of uh, screening already done on the candidate, uh, psychologically, physically, uh, emotionally, in terms of their skill and their knowledge and judgment. So uh, the military aviator has, has those advantages. Uh, that it's, it's not as, as evident in, in every uh, civilian training program. And so it's a, huge, it's a huge shift in demographics. And so now we're seeing uh, this fight in the industry over how much experience new pilots should have. And right now, believe it or not, it's possible, and in fact, not only is it possible, it's happened, where uh, a, a pilot will be hired as an airline pilot by a regional carrier and be assigned uh, to be a first officer, that's the co-pilot in the right seat of a regional jet, with as few as 250 or 300 hours of total flying time, all acquired in the training environment and not a, not a real-world operational environment. Um, and that was unheard of in my day. And now we're trying to get... Uh, them to, uh, to raise at least to 1,500 hours. But uh, it's, it's been a tough sell. There are a lot of people fighting it in terms of cost. There's another issue I know you've talked about in the past and are, and are concerned with, and that is the maintenance of aircraft, which have, has also been outsourced in many instances. Yes, much of the maintenance for all the major carriers now is done in El Salvador, in Mexico, in Singapore, in places around the world where it's cheaper or in some ways more convenient. And of course, with, especially with the budget cuts, the FAA doesn't have enough maintenance inspectors to more than an occasional token basis go visit these facilities. And of course, when they do visit, I'm sure that they all know when the American is coming and they, um, they act accordingly. And so um, yeah, that's why I wrote the book. I mean, it's, it, it, it really is a, a call for action for all of us to, to remember what's important in this country, to remember how we got where we are uh, and the kind of leadership it took to do that. And if we want to continue our leadership in the world, the kind of leaders we must have and the kind of choices we must all make and that we have responsibilities not only to each other but to our society to do so. Sully, if I'll play devil's advocate, if I'm an airline executive, I might say to you, airline, safe, airline travel has never been safer. It's getting safer all the time. And I'd say that we can no longer uh, afford the luxury of, of uh, living on past investments. I, I would say that we can no longer depend on the individual dedication and skill of individual employees to make for, up for what we know are systemic deficiencies. Right. You are listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. We are talking with Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, the former commercial airline pilot who landed the plane on the Hudson about what makes a great leader. He is the author of the new book, Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage, from America's leaders. And uh, Sully, let's talk about the book. Why this book? What was the idea behind it? Much of this book was already in me in the, in the sense that these are important concepts I've been thinking about studying my entire life. You know, what is the essential nature of leadership? And I think, like all of us, I had seen it done really well, and sometimes I'd seen it done not well at all. I'd seen people I had, had admired and respected, and some uh, who didn't. Uh, have that. And three and a half years ago, because of this amazing event and the way it touched people's lives and inspired them around the world, I was able to spend time with world leaders. Uh, you know, I've, I've met the president and been to the inauguration. I've been to Buckingham Palace. So we, we've done amazing things and met in, in, incredible people uh, and met people who have touched the lives of others, um, people who um, have inspired and me and people whom I respected. And so now I had a chance to hear their stories, have extended conversations with them, and pick their brains about what they thought and how they had lived their lives and what they had learned. And uh, so I just, I had to share, I had to put on the page these incredible personal stories, many of them funny, but all of them inspiring. And so that was really the genesis of this book, is having access to these people, having extended conversations with them, and, uh, and, and putting on the page what we learned. Uh, from our audience today, 
an interesting question. Could making a difference have been written before your landing on the Hudson? No, because I wouldn't have had the ability to have these conversations with people like Admiral Thad Allen, the recently retired commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, who was brought in in the darkest hours of the response to Hurricane Katrina and through the power of his leadership by personal example at a time when the entire workforce, uh, the, uh, the workforce was demoralized. They'd been beaten up in the press. He, uh, he got to New Orleans, and his military, military aide was a young woman, interestingly enough, named Katrina. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, Admiral, you've been brought in to fix this mess, this chaos. What are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm going to do the same thing that any new commander does. I'm going to have, have an all-hands meeting. And she said, Admiral, there are 4,000 people in this building, relief workers and others. And he said, well, gather as many of them together in one place as you can, and I want to talk to them. And so they gathered 2,500 people in the bottom floor of this one big building. And Admiral Allen stood up on a desk, grabbed a microphone, and in just a few words, with a very simple message, said, I'm going to give you an order. I want you to listen to me. This is a direct order. I want you to treat everyone you encounter as if they were a member of your immediate family, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. And if you do that, then two things are going to happen. First, if you make a mistake, you'll probably err on the side of doing too much, not too little. And second, if anyone has a problem with what you've done, then their problem is with me and not with you. And he said, you could hear a giant sigh emanate from everyone in the room. He said people actually began to weep because no one had before told them why they were doing what they were doing or why it was important or that their boss was behind them. And in a very simple way, he gave them that. And he gave them hope. And so he did the same thing when he led the response to the oil spill in the Gulf and to the, hurric to the uh, earthquake in Haiti in 2010. And, that, and that's just one story from one chapter. Leadership in this instance, uh, Thad Allen, involves responsibility, does it not? And assuming the buck, the old line, the buck stops here, he assumed the responsibility. He did. Letting his people to some degree off the hook for the full responsibility. Absolutely. He said, that this, the buck stops here. I'm taking full. It's my, for good, better, and different, it's my, well, or as I used to say in the airline before this all happened, you know, when, when I'm a captain of an airliner, whatever happens, good, better, and different, ultimately, it's my responsibility. On that day, you, Jeff Skiles was taking the plane off, correct? And yes. then immediately, when the birds hit, you took control. That's standard operating procedure, but that's also your responsibility as the leader of that crew, correct? And that's, that is the protocol. Well, actually, Jeff tells a funny story about that one particular part of, the, of it. Uh, you know, Jeff is a great pilot, and, and the fact that I took control has nothing to do with any lack of confidence in his skill or ability. Uh, and, you know, in spite of my best efforts for over three and a half years now, Jeff Skiles hasn't gotten the due that he deserves. Many of the crew and first responders haven't gotten as much recognition as I have. That's just the way the world works, the way the media works. And, uh, and so you know, when, when Jeff talks to audiences about this flight, he says, you know, he says, I deserve some recognition too. <laughs> After all, I'm the one who flew the airplane into the birds and made Sully the hero he is today. <laughs> so it's a good line. But, but uh, you know, it... What, what, what many people don't know about that situation is that even though Jeff is highly experienced, he has 20,000 hours of flying time like I do, and he had been a captain in the Boeing 737 before the last round of cutbacks forced him into the, the right seat of the Airbus, um, he, uh, he, this was his first trip on the Airbus after he'd been trained on it. And so one of the reasons I chose to fly is that I knew from my safety work that one of the best predictors of an outcome in any emergency is what we call time and type, how much time do you have in that particular kind of airplane? How well you know it inside out, all its, its systems, all its idiosyncrasies, all its nuances. And I've been on the Airbus about five and a half, almost six years, and I had about 5,000 hours in the airplane. And Jeff was brand new on it, even though he'd flown many other airplanes before. So for that reason, and the fact that all my options lay to my left, and I could see them out my left windows, and if Jeff were to continue to fly, he'd have to look across the cockpit beyond me and couldn't see far, as far back as I could. Uh, that and several others, it made sense for me to fly. But and these are decisions you made in an instant. That's a lot to process in an instant. Well, there were a lot of choices to make. I mean, it, it, if we were to go over that flight again, it would, I, and I've done this many times, so I know it would literally take me about 10 minutes to describe what happened in the first seconds because of, of all the things that 
that I didn't have time to consciously think about, but that were in the back of my mind, that, that were immediately accessible to me, so that helped me frame this decision, frame these choices. Because you have to realize that this was an, a novel and unanticipated event for which we'd never specifically trained. In fact, in our flight simulators, it's not possible to practice a water landing. You can't do it. it it's not possible. And so the only training that we'd ever gotten for a water landing was a theoretical classroom discussion. So that what that makes all this more, more remarkable because the fact that we got so much so right so quickly under those conditions is a real testament so to our So why skill. is that given that so many airports are around water? Why wouldn't they be in a simulator? It's, it's one of those things that's, uh, that's rare. And uh, you know, our training time is so limited, especially now with all the cost cutting. It's down to the absolute rock bottom regulatory requirement of what you have to have. Our, tri our time in our annual training every year is so limited, there's not time to practice everything. And, and they just deemed that that wasn't the... It's so unlikely. It's so unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the book. Uh, one of the other people that you profile uh, is John Bogle, who some of you may know the name, but mm -hmm. if you don't, your lives have been affected by what he did. And he really changed the way all of us invest our money, whether it's a 401k or you know, outside investments. Tell us why you picked him and uh, what you learned from him. Well, Jack Bogle is um, a, a well-known financial expert. He's the founder of Vanguard Funds and really created the low-cost mutual fund uh, that makes investing for all of us possible as, as you know, small investors. And you know, he's seen all these changes in the financial world. And so I chose Jack because I read a, an article about him some years before, and I kept it. I, I hung on to it. I was so impressed by his integrity to have the moral courage to criticize his own industry and to really call out people, sometimes by name, as he does in the book, about people he admires and, and those he doesn't, and about the kinds of values that, that people in, in that industry used to have and the kinds of values that apparently they now do have, or at least they act on. And so um, we have a lot to learn from him, and I hope that we, uh, that we don't forget, again, these lessons that other generations have learned about what works and what doesn't, because I think right now we're, we're still paying the prices for some of the things that happened as a result of uh, 2008, certainly. Uh, William Bratton is profiled in your book, and he is the New York City Police Commissioner, tough guy, a lot, lot of experience in law enforcement over the years, and he took on a very challenging department in New York City. And I think you describe him, maybe he describes himself, as a natural-born leader. What is that? You know, one of the questions I wanted to answer for myself, and by extension for the reader, is are leaders born or made? Uh, and so I, I chose people who were really a, a very diverse group, some who, like Bill Bratton, always thought of themselves as leaders, had, had taken active steps to become leaders. Um, really, he wanted to be an agent for change from a very early age and acted on it. And some, like Thad Allen, uh, sort of ended up there by accident. Um, and many others did, like, like Sue Sheridan. We'll, we'll get to her in a minute. Um, but I, I'm more convinced than ever that, that everyone can learn to be a leader or a more effective leader. And so one of the takeaways from my book, I think what sets my book apart from all the other leadership books that are on the shelves out there that are written for or by CEOs or by salespeople, this book is written for everybody. And these are, are, are things that we can all learn to do to make our lives more fulfilling at work, to make us more effective at, at work, at home, and at school. We can learn to do these things and, and begin using them tomorrow. What are some of the key, on that point, what are some of the key elements of leadership that well, you can it, identify that maybe we can learn if you don't well, naturally have it. I chose people who represent things I admire and respect, but all of whom had certain core qualities in, in common. Um, and I, I expected to find common themes running through all these very personal stories, which we did. I also wanted to be surprised and be challenged in my beliefs, and I was. But all these people view the world the same way, as an opportunity for good. And all of them are willing to do or able to do what uh, Gene Kranz uh, and others say, and that's to check their ego at the door. That, because ego is a leader's enemy. And, and these people are all willing, and they do serve cause, causes greater than themselves, than their own personal needs. They do it for the right reasons. They remember the why. 
why it's important to do these things, because we owe it to ourselves, to each other, to our organizations. Uh, and they, they make their actions match their words. These are the kinds of things we see. When you, when you survey people, leaders in, in many industries, and, and recently I read a paper uh, written by leaders in the healthcare industry, and when you have them describe what the traits and qualities of the next generation's leader should be, very few people mention knowledge or, or managerial skill or budgeting. They instead mention courage, perseverance, integrity, compassion, empathy, the ability to make a personal connection even with large groups of people. Uh, that's what matters. Empathy is a big one, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and all these people share that. Even, even the tough ones like Bill Braddon. They, they are able to instill a sense of professional pride in their officers. He said, he said he got people to when they would put their badge on their uniform in the morning and look in the mirror at themselves, it would be a, a, a daily reminder of why they were doing it, what their, what their job really was all about, and who their, who their customers were. Uh, one of the people you talk about in the book, it's such a moving story, and certainly as good an example as any in the book, I think, of, of putting others above self is Lieutenant Colonel Tammy Duckworth. You admire her dedication to military service, obviously, and she was quite a soldier, but uh, you admire her for reasons far beyond that, and I'll let you tell the story. But this woman uh, showed incredible courage during a, a tragic event and then afterward. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tammy Duckworth, when she was a uh, captain in the National Guard and activated for the Iraq War, was flying a helicopter, was shot down in Iraq, and in the crash lost both her legs and the use of one arm. Her crew, assuming that she was dead, recovered her body from the wreckage. It wasn't until everybody else who was injured had tourniquets on their wounds, they realized someone's uh, heart was still pumping out blood, and it wasn't theirs, and so they realized that she was still alive and began to give her medical aid. Uh, she was evacuated, brought back to the States. Uh, she had a bad reaction to pain medication and was doing without it for, for about five days in a row. And she said the only way that she could survive those five days was to break them into 60-second intervals. And so if you can imagine the kind of courage it takes for someone to, to survive for five days in intense pain with grievous injuries by counting to 60 over and over again. But she was able to have one-minute victories and, and through that, get through that intense period. And she said that um, in spite of her injuries, that she is the most optimistic person you'll ever meet, that she celebrates every year her alive day along with her crew who rescued her on the anniversary of that day, and that um, she's fearless. She says when she faces a challenge now, that she literally thinks to herself, this isn't my darkest hour. This isn't my darkest day because I've had that darkest hour and that darkest day, and this isn't it. And so now she's running for Congress. And, um, and she has the moral courage to do what's required to keep her people safe and to do what's right for all of us and, and more than her own needs. Paradoxically, she said that in Iraq, her platoon would do things for her that they probably wouldn't do for anybody else because they knew that she had their back. Amazing story. It's a fascinating passage in the book. Uh, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. We're talking with Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, the former commercial airline pilot who landed the plane on the Hudson, about what makes a great leader. My name is Dan Ashley, anchor of ABC 7 News in San Francisco. Um, Sully, one of the other uh, people profiled in your book, uh, Jennifer Granholm, Michigan's first female governor. She lives here now, does she? She know? does. She's at Berkeley along with her husband, Dan She's Miller. a professor, teacher. Yes. Why is she uh, in the book? What do you admire about her? Well, I, I told you the story about her favorite proverb about uh, planting trees under, sh under whose shade we'll never sit. You know, and, and facing the, uh, the terrible economics in, in the state of Michigan in the last decade, uh, when she first figured out that this problem wasn't going to go away, that this wasn't a local problem, this was a, a global structural problem with changes in the world economy. Uh, she rounded up all of her state agencies and had them work by breaking down silos, working together collaboratively to begin solving the problems with education, with retraining workers, with uh, 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 
uh, getting allies of the local companies because she tried and couldn't come up with enough money to bribe companies to stay. There wasn't enough money available to keep companies like uh, Electrolux and, and others from leaving for foreign lands where the wages are, are just a tiny fraction of what we can here. And so they'll help create other opportunities. They, they took what they did know in, in manufacturing automobiles and all the supplying uh, parts for those industries and, and doing renewable energy, uh, wind energy, solar energy to find new jobs and to, uh, to retrain workers as quickly as possible into those new jobs and match the skills with the job requirements sooner rather than later. Uh, and throughout the whole time, she was able to keep from cutting uh, the, the fundamental safety net for health care and for others. So it's, it's this kind of holistic approach, this kind of long-range thinking, this kind of collaboration, uh, or as she says, for those who are too uh, dogmatic and not pragmatic enough, uh, who we won't compromise, she says, quite frankly, very forthrightly, that a failure to compromise is a failure of leadership, mm -hmm. that she'll take half a loaf any day over none. On the subject of compromise, let's talk about the difference or the challenges, your observations about the challenges of leadership in political life versus other walks of life. Because it, there are a separate set of challenges in politics. In fact, someone in the audience asks, in Washington now we have politicians, not leaders, their opinion. There are real challenges if you're a politician to, to demonstrate some of the kind of leadership principles that you talk about. Absolutely. And, and one of the others profiled in the book is Robert Reich former labor secretary, brilliant man, one of our foremost political economists. He's also at Berkeley in the School of Public Policy. And I had a fascinating conversation with him, uh, by far the most uh, intellectually stimulating of, of all of them. And we talked about just these issues. You know, he's a bit older than I am. And when he grew up in the 50s, um, his assumption, and he corrected me when I said it was a goal. It was more basic than that. His assumption about the direction of his life would be that he would enter what he calls public service. And that sounds like kind of an antiquated term, doesn't it? But it's exactly what he means, it, serving the public. Um, and he wishes, and I wish, that more people weren't politicians, more people who didn't work in government, but they consider themselves public servants. And so he has a, that real sense of the common man. He has that real sense of, of what kind of leaders we need. But he and I agreed that in our current system, the incentives are misaligned. That um, right now, the influence of money is, is, is virtually unchecked, particularly in light of Citizens United, the recent Supreme Court decision that gives corporations virtually a, the unlimited amount to donate and super PACs. And so it, in a sense, disenfranchises the rest of us because, because whole industries and certainly companies are able to lobby to get regulations and rules written for their own benefit and not for the benefit of the public good. And so we need to change the way that we finance our elections. We need to change the way that our, our, our rules are written in the financial world and others so that we can more consistently achieve not only uh, productivity and profitability, but more consistent public good. And as a result, you're saying politicians are often beholden to where the money comes from. And ab special ab interests. Absolutely. They're and, trying to stay elected. And it's a, con it's a constant arms race. And so until we stop the constant arms race of money, I don't see anything changing that. Uh, someone else, that uh, a name you probably know from many years, uh, Gene Kranz, uh, NASA legend, really, chief of uh, mission control during the, the heady Apollo days, uh, always had this he was a tough guy, always had this cool demeanor, as you may recall when you watched NASA launches many years ago. You admired him for his cool demeanor, as we admired you for your cool demeanor that day, January 15, 2009. But more than that, you admired him for beyond his demeanor. Absolutely. And he's one of the ones who is able to check the ego at the door to really to build a team where everyone shares this, this core set of values and he demands excellence and, and, and holds them accountable for it. Uh, but people would, would uh, go to the ends of the earth for him. I asked him at the end of the interview, I said, did you and your team in Mission Control ever doubt that you'd get the crew of Apollo 13 back safely, the one that had to return from the moon when the explosion occurred? And he said, no, never, not for a second. And it's that kind of drive that uh, really impressed me about him. And of course, he'd been a fighter pilot also before, and, and I asked him, he said, you know, three, in the, the Apollo days, three of the four flight directors in the program had been high-performance jet pilots, and that kind of 
striving for excellence, that kind of sense of uh, camaraderie, uh, that those high standards stayed with him the rest of his life. How do you foster, uh, you know, you say Gene Kranz, uh, people would do anything for him, go to any lengths for him. How does a leader foster that kind of personal loyalty so that the person, to use your industry, the airline industry, so that the person flying the plane doesn't care any more about the outcome or the performance than the person loading a bag on the plane? Well, when I talked to Admiral Thad Allen, one of the people that we both admire is a USC professor named Warren Bennis, who has written probably two and a half dozen books on leadership. And a great man. I've met him and talked to him at length. And there are a couple of Bennis quotes that Thad Allen and I both like. One is this. When leaders treat followers with respect, followers respond with trust. And I think that's where it starts. Uh, it, it's a matter of uh, having real values, core values as a leader, and then choosing actually to live by them, to making it obvious through your actions what you believe and that you're doing things for the right reason. And when you treat people uh, well in a, in a climate of mutual respect, uh, it, it, that's the first step toward building the kind of trust that we have to have. Right. Uh, let's talk about, uh, we talked about uh, a natural born leader. Uh, let's talk about an accidental leader that you identify in the book, and that is Sue Sheridan. Uh, after a health crisis involving her newborn child and then later her husband, Pat. This is not a woman who was in a, a big job, a big career, a high-profile industry or anything of that nature, but yet you've identified her as showing great leadership. Through my patient safety work and applying what we've learned in aviation to medicine, uh, a physician friend of mine told me about this incredible woman, uh, a name you've never heard. In fact, many in medicine have never heard her name unless they've heard her talk. Uh, she's a mother of two from Boise, Idaho, whose family endured two terrible and preventable medical tragedies. But rather than be devastated by it, she got mad, and she decided to make it an opportunity for good. And so she educated herself, gained allies, and has become one of the foremost patient safety advocates on the planet and has helped to change the care for newborns globally. You know, her son um, was... Um, born uh, and, and uh, very quickly uh, was jaundiced and wasn't treated quickly enough and suffered brain damage. And he has cerebral palsy. He requires care the rest of his life. And uh, just at the end of that chapter, when you think her story cannot get any more gut-wrenching, she offers one final astonishing anecdote about when her daughter, Mackenzie, was born. And I'll leave it to the readers to find out what that is, but it's, it's, it's one more amazing bit of strength from this incredible woman. The accidental leader, and she, sh she has lived with such tragedy and showed such incredible grit. And, and, she's, and she's been a champion for helping others to become leaders. One of the things that she's done, besides uh, you know, face off with the often imperious medical establishment, uh, is she's replicated herself. She's traveled the world and uh, helped people around the world to become patient safety advocates in their own right. And so she's multiplied herself many times over. And working with the World Health Organization, you know, the, the, the power of the influence she's had is, is multiplied many fold. We talked about John Bogle, who's changed the way many of us invest through Vanguard and mutual mm -hmm. funds. Uh, there's another man profiled in the book who changed the way we all shop which is uh, Jim Senegal, uh, Costco's co-founder. And here's a guy, I don't know how old he is now, but in his 80s, is he? he he's, he's one of the co-founders of Costco. He recently retired as their CEO. Started as a bag boy in retail, right. and he created a, helped create a $78 billion empire. And that's not why you admire him. You admire him because of the way he Right. He's, he's one of those people who has taken the harder but the better path. He's able to do well while doing good. He's able to give great value to his um, customers, to provide value for his shareholders, and still treat his employees well. In fact, if you go into a Costco, and I do on a regular basis, and you look at the name badges of the employees, they have their year that they started with the company. It's often 20 or 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And think of any place else where people stay in that kind of a profession uh, that long. It must be because it's a good place to work, and I think it is. And, and one of the bellwethers of success that Jim Senegal has always used about how he's doing is he's managed to keep the price of the Costco hot dog 
constant at a dollar fifty since 1985. And, and we are grateful to him. And for can that. you think of anything else at the same price it was 27 years ago? Um, and and it's good. good quality. And it's good. Yeah. Um, one of my heroes, Sully, uh, is uh, Winston Churchill for a number of reasons. I know you have many heroes that are not discussed in this book. Who would you have liked to include in this book from history, perhaps? Or who would you include from history that you're obviously not able to talk to? Oh, Lincoln, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I mean, Jefferson, I mean, there are so many. Um, I mean, we, we, if I spoke Greek, we could go even further back. But uh, I, I think there are many people that we admired. Certainly, I think um, I've always been influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment, as were the founders of this country. Um, and so I, I think we, uh, we need to remind ourselves what those values are. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to talk to some of those people. Uh, as I'm going to sum up with the few fun, quick questions from the audience that are interesting. And, and, but let me wrap up with the book, Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage from America's Leaders. What do you want the takeaway to be ultimately from this text? Even if you don't have a big job or a fancy title, that you can learn to be a better leader. You can learn to be more fulfilled and effective at home, at school, at work, tomorrow. A couple of questions from the audience before we wrap up. Uh, what steps are needed to make you CEO of U.S. Airways? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the board would have to vote me uh, onto, the, onto the, yeah. that position. I, I don't think that's likely. I, I, uh, do you have any, I'm, I'm having I, fun I, with you. Do you want to, do you have, you know, I, you've been approached about politics and other I, things. I have actually just recently, uh, I was at a book signing in Danville, and, and somebody approached me just recently with, uh, with that again. But I think, quite frankly, that at this point at least, I'm more effective outside government than within. But I, I, I am trying to make a difference in, in a lot of ways in terms of safety, in terms of advocacy. Um, uh, as a, I'm busy as a speaker and an author, um, but I, th there might be... Um, opportunities in industry for me at some point. Who knows? Is life very fulfilling for you now? It's very different than it was three years ago. You were doing what you always wanted to do, which was fly planes. Uh, is this the best time of your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I talk in the book about a conversation I had with U.S. Airways management in, when I was becoming a consultant six months before the Hudson River landing. And at that time, I had said that I was 57 years old. I helped lead culture change at my airline in the cockpit by helping develop a leadership force there. Uh, I'd done a lot of safety work over the years, had a successful career. But if I, was, if I worked very hard, if I was fortunate, uh, it might be that my greatest contribution still lie ahead. And I feel that way now, that even after Flight 1549, if I work very hard, uh, if I'm particularly adept and if fortune smiles on me, I'm hoping that my greatest contribution still lie ahead. Fantastic. Um, you have two girls. I do. We know. Two wonderful girls. girls, and we're very, very fortunate. that we, we pinch ourselves every day that they're such great kids. They're terrific kids. Uh, are, are either of your girls interested in learning to fly? This is a question from the audience. No, not at all. In fact, I, my father was a dentist, and I never had any inclination at all. Uh, <laughs> to drill teeth? To drill teeth. So. But, 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 my, uh, but my older one in particular is very lucky, like I was. She has known from a very early age exactly what she's wanted to do with her life, and she's going to be a veterinarian. Oh, terrific. Um, this is, here's a great question from a young person in the audience. Hi, Captain Sully. My dad is a pilot and wanted me to ask you two questions. I thought this would be a nice way to end. Number one, have you flown or had the chance to fly in an F-22 Raptor? No, but I would love to. Right. That's our, uh, one of our country's newest jet fighters. Uh, and number two, you're an, an old Air Force man. Who has the better pilots, the Navy or the Air Force? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. You know, I, uh, my... Uh, Remember, the question never gets you in trouble. My... Uh, my, my first appointment to one of the military academies was actually to Annapolis. I was alternate for the Air Force Academy, and then the primary for the Air Force did something else, and so I, I, I chose to go to the Air Force. But I almost went to the Navy, and my dad was in the Navy in the Second War. Um, I think it requires great skill to land on a carrier jack, especially at night, and that's something I've never done. It would be kind of a neat thing to do if I were young again. But uh, I, I, think, um, I think that they are, they're, they're very similar. Again, the, the the product of this reg regimented discipline um, flight environment in which you have a, a professional attitude instilled at you from, a, from the very get-go.
Is that that training that you received ultimately, despite all of the hours in commercial aviation, that training you received in the military, was that absolutely critical for you to handle what you, how you, the, the event on uh, January 15th, the way you did? Was that the military training crucial? You know, that had been 35 years before, and uh, I think it, what, what it mattered more, quite frankly, was, was this, this attitude of continuous improvement, continuous learning, that I never flew 20,000 hours the same hour each, each time. I, I tried to always learn from it and make the next flight better than the previous one. And having paid attention and cared a lot, every day I came to work and tried to make each flight as best I could. I think that made more difference than, than what I'd done 35 years before. Our thanks to Captain Chesley, Sully Sullenberger, the former airline pilot who landed the plane on the Hudson January 15, 2009, saving 155 lives, and the author of the new book, Making a Difference, Stories of Vision and Courage from America's Leaders. Thank you all for being with us in the room, and thank you to our audience on radio for listening. Thank Captain you, Dan. Chesley Sullenberger.